Everyone, I think we're going to make a start. Um, so at this side event, seven organizations from around the world have, who either represent or work with investors have come together in Marrakesh. And what we'd like to do is highlight the actions that investors have taken since the Paris Agreement was adopted last year, but also to look forward to what is possible after Paris here in Marrakesh and beyond, particularly with the slightly new political environment that we're not operating in. So I'm Stephanie Pfeiffer, I'm from the Institutional Investors Group on Climate Change, which is a European network of 130 investors with 13 trillion euros in assets. Um, the other organizations um, that are putting on this event today are the Australian IGCC, the Asian AIGCC, Ceres from North America, the UNPRI, UNEPFI, and the Carbon Tracker Initiative. So we're going to hear from investors and others about the practical steps that investors have taken in 2016 to engage with companies on carbon reducing strategies, how they're deploying capital to low carbon assets, how they are more generally decarbonizing their investment portfolios and how they're engaging with policymakers and with regulators. And from an investor perspective, all these issues are critical because it will help preserve portfolio values and help investors meet their fiduciary obligations to their beneficiaries. And of course, it's critical that we ensure that finance flows become consistent with a two degree or below pathway so that we have a smooth transition to a low carbon economy. So there's been a slight change to the schedule and that Rachel Kite, the CEO and special representative of the UN Secretary General for Sustainable Energy for All will now speak at the end. So we will have two panels first, um, one on carbon risk and the other one more, much, in much more detail on investing in low carbon opportunities. And then we will have Rachel at the end. So I'd like to introduce this panel. Um, I'm joined by, on second to my left, we've got Pete Granis, who's the first deputy controller in the New York State Controller's Office. Um, the fund manages $180 billion uh, re in retirement funds. Then on my left, we've got Gerald Cartini, who is the CIO and a member of the board of the Dutch pension manager MN. They manage 125 billion euros of assets for 2 million beneficiaries. Um, we've also got Sue Reed, who is vice president for Ceres Climate and Energy Programme. And Ceres also manages the investor network on climate risk, which is a North American network for, I think, 120 investors with something like $14 trillion in assets. Um, and then on my right, I've got Anthony Hobley, the CEO of the Carbon Tracker Initiative, which is an independent financial think tank looking at carbon asset risk. And then on my far right, I've got Steve Waygood, who is Chief Responsible Investment Officer for Aviva, but is also a member of the FSB's Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, speaking in a personal capacity. So, so that's the lineup today. I will start by asking the investors on this side what actions they have taken and intend to take and bring in colleagues on the right here. And in the second round, we're going to delve a little bit deeper into the political landscape and what more regulators and policymakers can do. So we will get to the US election in the second round. Um, so I'll start with Pete from the US. Um, Pete, your work with the New York State Common Retirement Fund is, is aimed really at protecting its long-term value through action on issues such as climate change. Can you tell us what actions you have taken over the last year? Thank you, Stephanie. First, a correction. The sea change in our election doesn't take place until January 20th of next year. So with that said, we still have a few weeks of breathing room in the United States. Um, our pension fund is uh, 185 billion as of the last uh, valuation, the end of the last quarter. Uh, we look after a million people whose retirement benefits depend on our ability to generate a return so that we can cover their retirement security. Uh, we are a big multi-asset pension fund. We invest across the globe. Uh, we have very large holdings in public equities, both in the United States and uh, outside the United States, which we are actively engaged in. 
uh, with whom we're actually actively engaged on looking at their performance through our corporate engagement activities. We have a number of investment managers all across the globe who uh, we look to to incorporate ESG considerations and, and to respect our ESG screens on the investments they make. Um, we are constantly reminding them that they are not out there on their own. They're actually working for us. We pay them a great deal of money and we expect them to adhere to ESG principles in the that they bring to us through the money that we invest. Uh, since Paris, Paris, the controller, the state controller, whom I work, he's the sole trustee of this giant pension fund. We have always been concerned, at least for the last decade, with the risks associated with climate change. Uh, we benchmarked our existing portfolio out of the uh, in the last several years and found out that we were 15% below our indexed, uh, our benchmark indexed. But uh, last uh, December, the controller announced in Paris a low carbon index, which is a very unique instrument. Other people are looking to do somewhat the same things. Our, we seeded it with $2 billion. It uh, underweights uh, companies whose climate actions uh, are producing more carbon, overweights those that are producing less carbon. Um, it's a unique, at least for us, uh, exercise. It's producing the returns that we expected and clearly we have the ability to ramp up our uh, investments in the low carbon index as conditions warrant. Um, clearly an ongoing concern for our pension fund is not only the risks, which we've been very, very carefully monitoring and worrying about for quite a while. We are obviously very engaged in trying to find opportunities to deploy more of our assets in the green economy, uh, whether it's infrastructure or uh, other kinds of investments that produce the right results. We've actively engaged with the companies that we uh, are looking at, but clearly the difficulty is uh, deal flow. We're a big fund. We need to see big projects that are properly vetted. We don't uh, do impact investing. We don't do social investing. Our investment is entirely for the benefit of our beneficiaries in the pension system. And so we have to be extraordinarily careful. So as we deal with risks on one side, uh, I think which we are closely monitoring and, and spend a great deal of time worrying about their impact on our pension fund. <laughs> the, uh, um, the, 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 I guess the, the, the challenge for us is finding opportunities to deploy more of our assets into the green economy. Clearly the future is there. We understand that uh, even with the change of administrations, I think the die has been cast. There's no turning back. Businesses are making these decisions on their own. They're working with us and with our partners at Ceres through the investor network to change their business practices, to reflect the growing concern about the impact of some of their business practices on the environment. And so it's an ongoing effort. I don't think it will slow much, uh, at least as far as our pension fund is concerned as we look to the years ahead. Thanks, Pete. Gerald, if I could turn to you then. We've heard Pete talking about low carbon indices, infrastructure investment, engagement with companies from a is the same thing happening in Europe? And can you tell us what MN's strategy has been on climate and, and how you're implementing it? I should just say the audio is not, not that great, so if you could just speak up. Please. Okay. Thank you, uh, Stephanie. And um, well, at MN, we are a, a responsible investor. And you can imagine if you uh, manage assets in a fiduciary duty for one out of seven Dutch uh, citizens, that we are behaving very much like a responsible investor. So our framework goes back to 2008, way before Paris. Um, but at Paris, and even before Paris, we started already to think about climate change risk. And what we have done so far is started with a belief. And our belief is that we should work very much with engagement. Uh, engagement, what, what, well, one step back, research shows that Roughly 80 companies in the listed global equity world um, are, um, are responsible for over 50% of the global emissions. So that's only 80 companies. And we looked at all portfolios, we measured the carbon footprint, and what we have done is we started an active engagement program with roughly 30 companies, of which 12 we put into a called the Tier 1 bucket. The Tier 1 bucket says that we, uh, we ask, and we demand, and we challenge a transition of the business model of those polluting companies. And we give them two years to come up with actions and plans to convince us that they should stay in our portfolios. Um, the second step, what we have done, is similar to what Pete explained, 
half of our assets are deployed with external managers. Most of them, uh, most of them are based in the U.S. So we have worked with a framework together with uh, our partners, uh, IIGCC, but also the PDC and the PRI to come up with how should we monitor and challenge these external managers who, where we deploy our assets to. And I can tell you, every, every asset manager now which we have hired at MN has signed the PRI principles and has also now a clear ESG policy in place. And the next step is beyond the carbon footprint to have that dialogue with our external managers. Now, the third one which we did, we said the internal uh, climate change risk committee uh, next to our investment committee in order to create awareness at our portfolio management company or internal managers so that they take into account in the line uh, a carbon footprint uh, risk or the climate change risk. And the last step which we have done is cooperate with uh, several partners. First of all, the regulator, the Dutch Central Bank, um, but also partners like PGM and APG or peers in the mark and also outside the Netherlands. And we've worked with also, again, the partners to come up with, can we come up with a more global standard or disclosure? So disclosure is important for us to base our decisions on. And if disclosure is not unanimous, and in, if it is not a standard, decision making at ORHA will become very difficult. So that's in a nutshell the, the four steps which we have done. Great, thank you very much. Um, you already touched on the issue of engaging with companies and how critical that is. And, and I'd like to turn to Sue because, of course, collaboratively, investors have a, a stronger voice and can be much more effective with those company boards. Could you talk a little bit about what investors have been doing collaboratively, either in the US or globally, with companies? Thanks. Certainly. Thanks very much, Stephanie. Um, so, um, as others have suggested, we're clearly seeing momentum and tailwinds coming out of the historic Paris Agreement from late last year, and we saw that um, manifested in over 500 investors coming together at the UN at the Investor Summit on Climate Risk and um, Clean Trillion Opportunity with over $24 trillion in assets focused both on the risk side of the equation as well as clean energy investment opportunity and getting more action oriented and sharing practical examples of finance mechanisms and vehicles in addition to talking about the mega trends of clean energy transition. Um, we've seen it through the partnership um, of the Global Investor Coalition on Climate Change with all of the groups that Stephanie identified earlier, um, some of which are represented in the room today, coming together, laying out expectations for different sectors, including most recently the automotive sector, in terms of aligning business plans and practices with climate stabilization, and then directly engaging those companies to address the practices and plans that create extraordinary risk from a financial perspective as well as a climate perspective. Um, and that also has translated into direct um, shareholder resolution and stepped up engagement with some of the most carbon intensive companies in the world, companies like Exxon and Chevron, where we saw higher shareholder resolution votes um, in favor of calling on those companies to align their business plans with a two degree scenario than we've ever seen before. And that is through a transatlantic partnership um, with um, trillions of dollars of assets under management backing up these calls to action on these companies, um, we've uh, seen an incredible foundation built um, that we look forward to continuing to build on in the year and the proxy season ahead. Um, just one other example, and they are legion. We could um, spend hours here today, um, for, which is uh, part of the good news. There's a long way to go, and I don't want to suggest otherwise. Um, one other element I wanted to flag is um, a new partnership that Ceres and PRI are announcing today um, to step up investor engagement and work collaboratively with investors to engage companies involved in food supply chain and commodities that um, produce um, deforestation effects. So um, commodities like beef and soy and forests in addition to palm oil um, that leads to, um, with poor practices, leads to deforestation that not only um, has tremendous impacts in terms of loss of forest carbon sinks that are essential for the global balance of greenhouse gas emissions, 
and climate stabilization, loss of biodiversity, devastation of landscapes, but also tremendous risks from an economic and investor perspective. And so we're delighted with the support of the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation to be stepping up and launching this new global collaboration focused initially on South America on the deforestation equation. So thanks very much for being able to join me today. Thanks, Sue. Um, Anthony, I'd like to turn to you. You've heard from investors and investor groups of what is being done individually and collaboratively. Um, from your perspective, are we supporting the energy transition now? What more can be done? What, what do you see as the challenges that we need to meet over the next couple of years? I'll take that. Yeah. Mike. Steph Stephanie, thank you. Um, I think as probably most people know, and if, if you don't, a little refresher, I mean, Carbon Tracker are not-for-profit um entirely philanthropically funded think tank former financial market professionals the the sort of engine room of carbon tracker is eight former investment bank analysts so one of our ma our, sorry, our, our major tool is investment grade financial analysis and that's how we look at the energy transition and what our analysis tells us is we are in there is no doubt we are in a technology driven low carbon transition. So it's not a case of if, but it is quite critically a case of when. Will that happen quickly enough to keep to deliver a stable climate, keep us in the two degrees budget, and so on. And that's obviously the, the critical question. But that technology liver that technology driven transition is starting to eat away at demand for incumbent fossil fuels. It's starting to change the position in fossil fuels have lost their monopoly on energy driven energy generation and that's only going in one direction so in, in effect you know climate risk energy transition risk low carbon technology driven transition we'll call it what you will equals real financial risk to the companies that many financial institutions shareholders invest in the the financial risk is real so we often talk about SRI and ESG criteria um, and I think it, when we talk in those terms, it's, there's always this feeling that it's a nice to have. I think what we're seeing through our analytics is this is no longer a nice to have. This goes to the core of investment decisions. It, it is a real financial risk that is destroying value. And we've seen this in the United States in the last, well, globally in the coal industry, most, most visible in the United States with listed coal equities that have lost over 90% of their value of over 30 companies going into chapter 11. We've seen it in Europe with European utilities who made the wrong bet on fossil fuels and nuclear rather than renewables and who've lost 60 to 80 percent of their value over the last decade. So it's already playing out. Investors are already losing money. Business models are already changing. So to come to the question, you know, the transition is clearly underway. What should investors be doing? What more can they be doing? Well, I think they, they can, you know, they can wake up Many, many, quite honestly, for the last several decades have probably been asleep at the wheel. They can look at their peers who are awake, who are assessing the risk and follow their model. We've heard two examples of that on the panel. They can start to look, really engage with the companies, not just around the edges, but really to the core business model and understand to what extent the businesses are preparing ensuring that their business models are consistent with this low carbon transition, what, what preparations the companies are making to manage that risk and the likely downside on those business models and of course share price, dividend, etc. if they are not. They can engage with the Financial Stability Board task force process we're going to hear and the recommendations that have come out and really ensure that they're getting the disclosures they need and then acting on those disclosures to understand the risk and to ensure, again, they're making the right investment decisions, but also the companies that they effectively own are properly managing this risk. And I know we said we were going to leave Trump to the next um, panel, but I think that the election, President-elect Trump, is also relevant to risk, very much so. I think in many ways, the policy uncertainty that this decision undoubtedly ushers in, and, and of course we don't know in practice which way he is going to go, um, time will tell, but it does certainly for the time being usher in more policy uncertainty. That policy uncertainty increases the risk for shareholders and investors. It increases the risk of a disorderly transition rather than an orderly transition. 
it, it increases the need for the sort of analytics that, that we do and the, the sort of investor disclosures that the Financial Stability Board Task Force is working on. Um, it, and I think it increases the role um, and the responsibility, if you like, on the investment community um, to be much more engaged um, on this issue, but also with the companies um, within which they're invested. Thanks, Anthony. So that we've, we've heard disclosure mentioned twice now. You, you mentioned it, Anthony, you mentioned it. Steve, that brings me to you, of course. Um, the FSB's task force was launched in Paris last year. The report is coming out by the end of this year. Can you tell us what we can expect and how it will help investors with their analysis? Thank you, Stephanie. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I should, I'd like to start by congratulating Carbon Tracker and Anthony and the team for the amazing work they've done changing the face of the debate on the financial impacts on climate change over the last five years. It's been a pleasure to watch. Um, now, I'm speaking as a member of the task force, as you said, not on behalf of the whole task force. Um, in terms of timeline, Many of you may have seen the uh, draft, the phase one report that came out in March. There was a consultation process that, that closed in, uh, in May on that. Uh, there's uh, the, the consultation documents already online. We've got, in two weeks from now, the FSB will be looking at the first draft, first full draft um, of the phase two report. And we will then be consulting as the task force in, through December and most of January. And for those of you that are really interested in the debate, please download the consultation. If you think you might miss it, subscribe, go online, look at the websites, the task force is set up, subscribe to receive it. Um, we are consulting very broadly, we want a lot of feedback. Um, the phase after that will be in March, the um, G20 Finance Committee will be meeting, um, and we hope to then have the conclusion uh, shortly thereafter, the final document that will then go out. So what, what can you expect? Um, one of the new paradigms that I'm very proud that is in the document is the, it's not just about the issuers, it's not just about companies. Most of you probably think it's about companies and the kind of CDP mindset. Well, it, in this case, it's about the whole supply chain of capital. So it's not just the companies issuing the data, but what do the brokers then do with it? What do stock exchanges do to contribute to that debate? What do fund managers do when we use the data? We're, I represent the Viva Investors, we're a fund manager. How do we embed it in our investment decision-making? How do we embed it in our voting? There's also a role for investment consultants who sit between us and the pension schemes. And then the pension schemes that manage your money as beneficiaries, what are they doing with it? So there are, there are recommendations, not requirements, because the whole remit is about recommendations, voluntary recommendations, not legal requirements. There are recommendations for the whole supply chain. Now, Coming back to the fourfold framework that we're proposing, and you'll see the details of this in December, at least the initial draft. The first is climate risk governance. What are the boards of these institutions doing to govern the risks properly? Uh, how, which is, which di is there a director nominated for managing these issues, governing these issues? What kind of, what's the role of the subcommittees? Uh, for some sectors, is it embedded in remuneration? Second, strategy. To what extent is the business model, as Anthony referred to, or the strategy of the business reflecting the climate risks? Third, on the risk management framework, we've been given, because it comes from Mark Carney and he has this prudential regulatory framework, we think of transition risk, we're thinking of um, liabilities and physical risk as well. And so that threefold risk framework, there's some details of what risk committees and what audit committees might be doing with that. And then finally, the fourth element of the disclosures obviously key performance indicators and they will be qualitative they will be quantitative they will be historic and I think a new a new area they'll be forward-looking and you should expect to see quite a lot in there about scenario planning what does it mean to the company to exist in a sub two degree world what what are the risks or opportunities that presents what has the board done to think them through and plan accordingly now as I say um, the consultation the first draft the first full draft will be issued in December um, it's not for me to give away any more than I have. I've given you a bit of a framework, but please read, engage and respond. And crucially, both challenge and support because it's a once in a generation opportunity to change the face of corporate disclosure in this space at scale. And I will finally say, um, I personally think that the voluntary recommendations that we as a task force have been told that we have to make won't go far enough. So as a person, as an individual, I think as civil society, you should be calling for those recommendations to become binding. And I'd like to reflect on that in my second set of comments. 
Okay. Well, we've got 10 minutes left, so I'm going to move straight into the second round. Pete, can I, can I go back to you? Um, Steve's already said these recommendations are going to be voluntary. Um, what does this, you know, with the election of Donald Trump and big part of the G20, what does this mean for disclosure more generally and where you, where you would like to see regulators go? Well, given what uh, the president-elect has said during the campaign, I doubt that we're going to be able to move anything from the voluntary column to the uh, requirement column. And that's one of the risks, I think, associated with this new administration, is we lose the access to regulatory oversight. Uh, our fund has worked closely with the SEC and with the stock exchange, uh, the series stock exchange, uh, reporting standards, and clearly what the FSB is doing is doing the same thing, trying to come up with a unified set of requirements and disclosure documents that uh, will be the same for all companies so that we'll be able to compare across the board what companies are doing. Um, I think we're going to have to rely on the clout that we have as a major institutional investor, uh, our partners, series, uh, the investor networks, our other sister plans, which are sometimes even a little bigger than we are, collectively calling on companies to do what is necessary for us to be able to make the right kinds of decisions on our holdings in these various companies, whether it's talking to management, whether it's divesting, whether it's reinvesting or moving our money to a low carbon index. Um, there's a host of things that will be on the table, but I am not optimistic about a regulatory framework which is going to mandate disclosure of materiality um, any further than we are today, uh, at least for the next four years. Thank you. Sue, do you want to come in on that and just explain what more we as investor groups will need to do to, to drive for disclosure from companies? Sure. Um, and I'd love to broaden the lens just a little bit beyond um, disclosure in terms of implications of um, earlier events this week in the United States. So um, I think the results of this election would be far more jarring if they had occurred four, eight, or 12 years ago, in that the clean energy proposition has never been more sound from a straight up economic and business perspective. And so it's then not surprising that even in the last few days, we're seeing companies renew and build commitments to clean energy procurement. Um, just before and after the election from um, Mars's announcement this morning um, to stepped up um, a commitment in terms of wind energy, Walmart um, doubling its clean energy investment commitment. Um, so the straight up purchases by businesses and commitments to clean energy deployment, we expect that to continue and we expect um, for companies that are not doing so for investors to step up their engagement um, because both renewables and efficiency are a sound business proposition and businesses are leaving value on the table and not advancing long term um, economic financial um, viability and building resilience by continuing down this path that has been set in motion. Um, you can't disentangle that from disclosure, of course, so um, you can only lean on um, what you know about or um, you can um, uh, act on information you know about, but um, investors are very attuned to the importance of disclosure. We've seen such dramatically escalated efforts through the Financial Stability Board's task force on um, climate-related financial disclosures, though um, that will result in recommendations that will equip investors to go out and um, get even more crisp in terms of sector-by-sector -sector engagement and expe expectations for what's congruent with climate stabilization and a two-degree scenario, and nothing that has happened with the US presidential election is going to affect those dynamics that persist globally. And certainly, um, we expect to continue to be of keen concern to investors in North America and series investor network on climate risk and beyond. Right. Thanks, Sue. That's a very positive message. Um, Gerald, we're in a slightly different position in Europe. We've, yes. we've got the French national law, the energy transition law. We hear the Dutch National Bank is, is looking at the issue quite in some detail. Could you reflect a little bit on the environment in Europe, please? Absolutely. Um, I've said earlier, it's a irreversible trend. Um, the Dutch Central Bank has now incorporated in its uh, mandate that climate change risk is that is uh, in the framework for all Dutch pension funds. That means that 1.4 trillion of the Dutch pension assets are now being being close looked at by, by the regulatory uh, forces, how they deal with climate change risk. Um, it's a great initiative and that will that means that uh, this trend will move forward. Um, 
what we need more is cooperation because of course we have seen Carney now the Dutch Central Bank France is doing it uh, on its own way uh, I would say that we need also there a bit more of European co cooperation that we come up with a um, you know systematic approach where where all pension fund assets through Europe go through the same methodology um, that's something which we still um, uh, uh, I think would give a boost in the in European discussion um, MN is uh, is chairing actually one of the supervisory of uh, one of the the central bank's uh, working streams. We uh, my CEO is uh, on the is the chairman of the climate change risk committee. So we work with all the pension fund assets in the Netherlands and with the supervisor to come up with a good standard. And I hope that we can also uh, show uh, to you what we have uh, done there, and that we can uh, show also uh, to other countries uh, maybe to take this uh, example as well. Thanks very much. Anthony, do you want to add to that at all? What more would you like to see from the regulatory space? Gerald is suggesting more European cooperation between the regulators. Yes, no, I, I would absolutely endorse that. I mean, I, you know, what we don't want to come out of this whole process is a patchwork of, you know, different standards and approaches. Um, you know, the best thing that can possibly happen, provided it's robust and it's not the sort of you know lowest common denominator, is that you've got a sort of harmonised approach, and it's very much and also it's very much an approach that no longer treats this as a nice to have peripheral sort of warm fuzzy issue, but actually recognises that this is a real issue of financial risk that should be at the heart of all disclosures and that investors take into account not a not a nice to have and i guess would most like to see policymakers and regulators to do is when the fsb task force recommendations come out they do work to some degree consistently for a common approach we're already hearing noises i think from the chinese um, and the french and others about making disclosure of climate risk mandatory but uh, which will be you know i you know we, we would not be against but it, it is critical i think that the different central banks that are now following the lead of the bank of england um don't all follow their own road and we end up with a sort of patchwork of approaches a sort of consistent approach would be best um provided with a big caveat that what we don't have is a race to the bottom and the lowest um common denominator and again you know repeat what i said the first time around i think in this new political world that we um you know live in i don't dare i say it, you know world trump or trump world that we now live in um it, this sort of disclosure is more critical than ever thank you and and so for just final remarks maybe from steve mark carney spoke of the tragedy of horizons meaning all too short term investors regulators and companies and before we know it, we've got a financial stability risk. Would you like to reflect on how we collectively address that issue? And can we rewrite the tragedy? Yes, we can. So if you think about the horizons that Mark Carney was referring to, they're human constructs. What's the horizon of a company? What's the horizon of a regulator? What's the horizon of civil society or academia? It, it wasn't just restricted to uh, commercial institutions. Now, all of these are, are human constructs. For example, governments write the mandate of regulators. They dictate over how many years they look, and it could go beyond three to five, as it is at the moment. Why, why do we have to stay with what we have? So um, what I'd like us to all think about is this tragedy of horizons, how do we rewrite it? We, we have an event tomorrow with Mission 2020, three o'clock at the Radisson, um, where we'll be publishing a, a report, Seeing Beyond the Tragedy of Horizons. If you can't make it, Google that report tomorrow, Seeing Beyond the Tragedy of Horizons. And there are six ideas in there. Um, I'm just going to highlight a few because I know you're short on time. Um, firstly, if you think about the challenge purely practically, the task force is going to apply to tens of thousands of institutions. Most of them will be thinking about this risk, climate risk, for the first time. And they will be ill-equipped internally and probably the external consultants will be overwhelmed. So purely practically, we need to educate at speed. And we also need to check the MBA programs, the Chartered Financial Analyst program, and all the non-executive director education schemes include climate risk within it. There's a kind of a role for civil society there. Second, climate risk governance needs to become a norm. 
where every board understands what it means to govern this risk properly. Now, there is a, a set of principles that underpin pretty much every national corporate governance code. They're the G20 OECD principles on corporate governance. I personally think, even though it's been relatively recently updated, it's time to look again at those principles and ensure that they reflect climate risk governance. And then finally, financial regulators, the International Accounting Standards Board, in my personal view, should look again at what extractive sector companies are asked to say in their proven and probable reserve accounting framework in terms of what the carbon rucksack of the fossil fuels that they carry is likely to be. And um, in terms of getting data out there, we could ask for voluntarism to work, which as I've mentioned earlier, personally, I don't think will. Or we can look at company law, which I think takes a long time to rewrite. Once you open it, there are many other issues that come up. Or possibly, and this is my personal preference, we could look to stock exchanges and the securities the, um, the, the listing authorities like the SEC to come together internationally in the International Organization of Security Commissions and take the FSB framework and make it live and breathe through the listing rules. Now, that's my personal preference. And as I say, I'm not speaking on behalf of the task force when I say that, it's my personal view. But it's something that we could all call on IOSCO to do. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Steve. Gerald, would you like Christian, to just say a final word and then I'm going to have to wrap up? Yeah, like one, one uh, uh, personal comment for me as, as well. I'd like to ask all my fellow investors that uh, measuring carbon footprint today is not good enough anymore. We need to move to the next phase well beyond the Montreal Pledge. We need to move into uh, the transition and have the engagement with the companies. And uh, for those who haven't uh, seen yet, the PDC report just came out. Uh, this is a good example of the way we should follow all as investors. So if you haven't read it, uh, please, uh, please do so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I hope you've had a good overview of what the investors are doing. You've sort of seen our timeline and plans for next year. We've heard that Trump isn't going to destroy all the action we've already seen, but the investors are going to do even more now. So please thank the panelists before we go on to the second panel. Great. Thank you very much, um, Stephanie, um, for that previous panel that was really focusing on risk. Um, my name is Sagarika Chatterjee, and I work at the UN-supported Principles for Responsible Investment, an investor initiative um, representing $62 trillion in assets under management. Um, I'm very sorry that Fiona Reynolds is unable to join us, um, as um, something came up for her, so I'll be covering in her place. Um, and. Um, uh, on to our panel. So we're joined by five excellent speakers today who are really going to probe and talk to us about the opportunity side. So previous panel on risk, now moving over to thinking about the exciting investment opportunities. And this is a core topic for COP22. It's a real challenge. Um, and where investors see their role is in being able to complement um, what governments are doing on the finance side and not a substitute for this um, in any way. Um, so I have on um, this side of me, delighted to introduce um, Eric Decker, um, who's Chief Investment Officer of AXA, Mediterranean and LATAM. Um, also on my right is James Close, Director of Climate Change Group at the World um, Bank. Mike Eckhart on this side, who is Managing Director, Global Head of Environmental Finance and Sustainability at Citigroup. And on that side, Michael Lewis, who is Managing Director, 
Head of Sustainable Finance at Deutsche Asset Management. Um, so I'm going to go st straight into the session. So first with you, Eric. So this time last year, um, we were sitting in um, Paris, Paris Agreement, with um, your um, former CEO, Henri de Castri, um, who previously at Paris Finance Day, which was in May 2015, made some really significant in, uh, announcements that went down the news wires, I remember, um, including coal divestment and three billion um, uh, euro allocation to green bonds. Meanwhile, in France over the last year, um, you've had the French energy transition law. So, Eric, could you just tell us a bit about what AXA has done since COP21 and now what you plan to do going forward um, with the Paris Agreement in force? Well, thank you. Uh, how long do I have? This is a lot of things. <laughs> a couple of minutes. To talk about very, very, very quickly. Um, well, we've done a lot because uh, in AXA, uh, climate change has been a, a hot topic uh, for many years. And, uh, and Henri, and uh, before he left, and with his second in command, Denis Duverne, they've been you know, very, they had, they had at heart, you know, to do things, things and, and, and move on, 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 on investments. So basically they had announced uh, selling out of uh, the coal mining industry. So we sold uh, 500 million euros of assets. We, we also sold the tobacco industry for over 200 million uh, euros. And basically all of these were exclusion lists. And I think that what is really important is what has been told or what has been said in the previous panel is that we need to move away from exclusion list to positive listing or positive approach through ESG. So what we've been doing since uh, COP21, and that was also one of uh, Henri de Castro's commitment, uh, was to install ESG or principle of responsible investment in our asset management. So with our asset managers, we've moved and developed a methodology and we also have therefore now reports and internal committees going through our investments and making decisions on in our security selection on on this review of responsible investment or ESG however we want to call it and I think this is very important we are not talking about short-term investment with just announcement we're speaking about AXA manages 700 billion of assets. We need to have a long-term view at our asset strategies. We are invested in obviously bonds, equity, real estate, and we need to have a framework to correctly invest our money for our shareholder and policyholders. So today, what we are looking for is through our ESG approach, leave the exclusion list, move towards engagement on those companies by sectors showing weaknesses, and eventually not investing in them anymore, but at least on a solid basis of framework, of a framework. And you know what's going to happen, and I think that one mentioned earlier, it's basically those companies not making the effort will find less financing, or the cost of financing is going to increase because we all have objective and we need to make sure through the FSB task force and the French transition laws, this is my way of making the bridge to this reporting, we will have to report and we will have to say what we're doing to make sure that we are within the plus two degree environment. And so all these outliers by sectors, those companies not really playing the game, we just, you know, for us, for AXA responsibility, fiduciary responsibility, we're just going to have to not continue reinvesting when our bonds are maturing. We're just not going to invest in those companies anymore. And at one point in time, through time, you know, those companies will have to elect to play the game or not play the game. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Eric. Um, James, so last year, the World Bank formed um, a carbon pricing leadership coalition. Um, and recently, we just had the IFC produce a new report on climate investment opportunities in emerging markets. Could you just tell us a bit about those developments and what they what you think they signal? Yeah, sure. Uh, so great. Um, I think the carbon pricing piece is really an attempt at to getting prices right to enable investors to make good decisions around uh, their portfolios. 
Um, I think, uh, it, and it's not just about carbon prices, it's also around fossil fuel subsidy reform as well. I mean, these things distort markets and uh, make investment uh, more difficult. Uh, we've seen an enormous uptake on the carbon pricing side of things. Now 13% of uh, GHG emissions are covered by carbon pricing schemes. Uh, and they uh, create $26 billion worth of revenue, uh, which is a 60% increase on last year. So this is really starting to take uh, some shape. Uh, in the NDCs that were committed in Paris, over 100 countries included carbon pricing in their NDCs. Uh, and uh, now 40 have already got uh, active uh, uh, schemes in place and 20 cities are also uh, doing this as well. Uh, I was in the China Pavilion this morning listening to them to talk around about their seven uh, ETS uh, schemes that they've got operating in uh, provinces and South Korea, Chile, Korea, um, uh, Turkey, Cote d'Ivoire and Ethiopia, a whole real range of countries are putting in place uh, carbon pricing schemes. And that's also mirrored by the private sector. Many private sector companies uh, are putting uh, schemes in place. There's over a thousand companies who have signed up to the um, uh, the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition, and uh, some of the work that the CDP did suggests that uh, over 86% of consumer uh, companies um, have got emissions targets: 61% to 2020 and 13% uh, beyond 2030. But only a small portion, 16%, are science-based. So we're making good progress on carbon pricing. Uh, but there's more to do. I think on the investment side of things, the uh, the IFC, our sister company that invests in private sector businesses, uh, produced a report this week um, that looked across the NDCs and started to identify attractive investments as a result of uh, the declared policies that countries were making. This report's called the Climate Investment Opportunities in Emerging Markets. Uh, and it's extraordinary, really, uh, of the 21 countries that were uh, analyzed $23 trillion between now and 2030 is available in smart investment opportunities. Uh, a big chunk of that's in green buildings. We know that we have to have efficient and low carbon buildings uh, in the future with other major areas being sustainable transport and of course renewables. Um, so I think that signals that these NDCs really are investment plans uh, for companies and investors. Thank you. And um, Mike, Citi's very mainstream, large, significant institution, if you don't mind me saying that. Can you tell me what you're doing in this whole low carbon area and also particularly how you're collaborating with others? Yes, thank you. And uh, thank you, Sue, for having me and glad to be here. Yeah, Citi is quite a large institution, um, 220,000 people in offices in 100 countries doing business in 160 countries. 70% of our assets and people are outside the U.S., even though we're New York City based and founded two, over 200 years ago. So you're right, big institution. Now, what are we doing? Uh, two years ago, we set a goal to do $100 billion in sustainable finance in a 10-year period. Why that? Because in 2013, we did $10 billion, and we thought we were doing very well. We participated, many banks involved in some of these deals, not just us alone. So we thought 10 times that, let's set that as a goal and go for it. In 2014, we, we did 24, and last year we did $48 billion of deals. We doubled and doubled. That's what's happened in the marketplace. As our very large clients have come into the space, these are our historic clients, and we're doing those very large deals. So our numbers are very, very large, even though we actually work with relatively few clients, a couple of dozen clients around the world, but they tend to be very big. Now, what we have done is innovate. These clients need good deals, and they're extremely sophisticated, not basic. And so we've done innovation in hedging the offtake of wind farms. We co-created, uh, so happens with Goldman Sachs, the first yield co, which became a model in the market, which is still working its way out. We, city instigated the idea of the green bond principles, drafted them, and recruited the other banks into the fold, and now it's a major global institution. So innovation for large, capable clients, doing very large deals, and it's gone to scale. And Mike, just tell me a bit. So what are the challenges to scaling that up further? Because we'd like to see the billions going to the trillions. Me again? Oh, fine. Uh, what is it going to take to scale up? Well, scale up to what? Look, there's $200 trillion in the world's capital markets, about 140 in the bond market, which is why 
We did the green bond principles. We want no mistakes there. That's the end game for 40 years of work on clean energy and 60 or 70 trillion in the, in the stock market. This is all a bond market play. This is long-term low cost debt capital, which exists in the debt capital markets. Uh, just a point on that, we had City place a, a billion dollars in the debt capital markets an hour, an hour per hour. That's how big the capital market, and we're just one bank. Um, so how to scale this thing up? It's all about one word, and it was mentioned on the previous panel. We're all about, well, it's, it's return and risk, right? No, it's not about return anymore. Every good project going ahead is going to have a return. The question is risk, right? Risk. It's all about risk. And that's where the two sectors can work together, where the public sector can be absorbing risks that the private sector literally can't take. And one can say, well, why don't you take it? Well, I would characterize our world to put, put a tag on it. We're living in a world of COP21 versus Basel III. We got half the world saying, take more risk, scale up, long-term financing. And the other half of the world saying, slow it down, pal. You're not making long-term loans. You're not taking risk. Just slow it down. So a thing that the, the UNFCC process might bring together as a suggestion is to bring those two camps together, to have a discussion about what kind of financing is feasible. What are the rules of financing going forward? Because the rules of the world have changed. So that's something that I would suggest. A second thing to do would be to think about, <clears throat> um, to think about scaling up the MDBs, the World Bank, the IFC, the EIB, Chris, everyone. Um, the challenge has grown but our development banks have not. And we're being asked as commercial banks to fill that gap. But we're not development banks. And again, Basel III, we literally can't do that job. The MDBs have a bigger job to do today, not a smaller job. So I don't know how to scale it up and still keep AAA bond ratings and so forth, but let's start thinking about that here in the UNFCC process about to do that. And then lastly, on the risk, we passed the law in the United States, PURPA, in 1978, Public Utility Regulatory Policy Act, which was an off-take guarantee. I participated in writing the feed-in tariff in Germany in 1998, just so happens, just happened to be in the room. All right, that is an off-take guarantee. The rest of the world suffers for lack of an off-take guarantee. And renewable energy, clean energy has succeeded in the US and Europe and other places like China, which has an off-take guarantee where there's off-take guarantees to allow 20-year loans to be made. That's the problem. So we've put forward a paper for Clean Energy Project Assurance Corp, an off-take guarantee agency for the UN Green Climate Fund, and we hope the, UN, the process takes that up. So those are three ideas how to scale them. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, Michael, so Deutsche Bank is the first commercial bank to have an investment proposal approved by the Green Climate Fund. And also earlier this year, you published a report on the value of incorporating sustainability factors into investment decision making. Could you just tell us a bit more about what you're doing and why? Absolutely. Um, well, Mike's point about risk is very relevant for us and our relationship with the Green Climate Fund. We're naturally honoured to have been accredited last year. Um, our proposal was approved last month. And... Uh, this is a proposal that's the delivery of uh, clean, sustainable energy across sub-Saharan Africa. Um, the countries that were focused on in the first stage, um, uh, and if any of you, the, you are representative of these countries, come and talk to us afterwards. Um, Benin, Tanzania, uh, Kenya, Nigeria, and Namibia. And uh, really the aim is that technologies that focus on home solar systems, uh, microgrids, and uh, solar supplying small, medium-sized enterprises, so very, very small-scale uh, operations. Um, I think why we're so pleased about this is that it is very difficult to attract um, investors into Africa, and particularly into off-grid um, activities. Um, I think the issue of risk is really important because uh, if you look at this type of activity um, uh, as it relates to uh, the unfamiliarity for investors of African financial institutions, also the macro and regulatory risk, you'd really be looking at um, uh, of requirements of equity returns of sort of 20% or something like that. And I think the, really the structure with the Green Climate Fund and this public-private partnership is really essential to draw in uh, that investor and the capital raising that we will now be doing. Um, the Green Climate Fund has um, uh, put forward $80 million, we'll be bringing in a total of $300 million into this plan. And uh, I think it, it uh, with the structure, it is a first loss. 
So there is a buffer in terms of the risk um, versus the private sector. So that's a, a very helpful a sort of ingredient within this. I think also another important point is that these are this is a long a fund that is long term debt uh, to local finance financial institutions that extend long term loans in local currency terms to energy supply companies. So this sort of to us makes it a much more sustainable operation. Um, the life cycle of it is around about 15 years, and uh, we estimate that this should be. Uh, around about capital investment of about three and a half billion. So, uh, and with the sort of the network of African bank partnerships that we have, um, we're very pleased and uh, very grateful uh, to be partnered up with the Green Climate Fund on this. And I hope that we will be proposing more and more of these uh, in, in the months and years ahead. Um, uh, in terms of the report that we published, which is a bit drier, I'm afraid, uh, but you can Google it if you're interested, um, Sustainable Finance Report, Deutsche Rest Management. Um, and uh, I think this was for a much broader audience. And I was also sort of mentioning in terms of Africa, trying to bring in people to Africa and off-grid is, is a very small community, but we hope it's going to get bigger and bigger. Um, the report really was trying to broaden it out. And I, maybe one of the, well, there are about six or seven articles within this report. I think probably the most important one, primarily because the UNPRI did a forward for us, um, uh, was uh, just re-reviewing the entire academic literature since the 1970s of ESG and corporate financial performance. And uh, there's been about two, three or 4,000 uh, articles on this topic. And we really wanted to try and make it easy for everybody. And uh, we wanted to say, well, where are there, are there positive links? And there are unambiguous positive links. And we also wanted to see which asset classes um, were most uh, effective uh, and showed that strong positive relationship of incorporating sustainability. Uh, real estate was uh, the leader uh, and all the other asset classes performed very well, but real estate, and this kind of mirrored actually the ESG AUM that we have within Deutsche Asset Management, very skewed to the real estate, state, real estate sector. And I think the retrofitting energy efficiency is just such a great story there, and particularly linking with the asset-backed green bonds, fantastic. So I think this is a major area for growth. Um, and then finally, just in terms of uh, disclosure that we were talking about earlier in emerging markets, that was a one region where ESG and corporate financial performance and disclosure was really positive findings. And I think that would be something that we would sort of say, particularly on this continent, disclosure would be great. And if it could be also in English, that would be fantastic as well. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. I wanted to flip back quickly to Eric. So, um, as CIO of... Um, <laughs> Thank you. Of the Mediterranean and Latin America. So we're talking about sub-Saharan Africa there. What kind of opportunities do you see in low carbon? Um, and what do you think needs to happen to scale it up very briefly? Well, at, at this stage, at this stage, uh, you know, on the green bond initiatives, everything that we've done, and I'm answering the question now, everything that we've done is only in the US and in Europe. And in Europe. In the U.S. and in Europe, nothing in nothing in Africa at this particular stage. What do we need to have to see happening before we invest? We've only done in in Africa a, a couple of investment in private equity funds, but it's not it's not green type of investment. Private equity is basically you invest in companies, wait for their turnaround, and sell it. For green bonds, we need projects. We need green projects. We need infrastructure type of project, long-term views, stability of local governments, local infrastructures, so that you know we deploy the capital. So we feel confident that basically, you know, the company, the environment, the culture, the local culture will be there in the next 10, 15 to 20 years. And the thing, because you know, at least for the exercise, we can always invest 10 million or 15 million, but this is not a game changer for anybody. For a win-win situation, we want to invest hundreds of million or in billion. I think the capital is there. We just need to make sure that when the big players are coming and we deploy the capital, not government-related type of entities, but pro, you know, institutional investors, that we feel comfortable that the money will be there you know, in the end because we do have responsibility to our shareholders, to our management, and to our clients. And I think it's all about risk and it's all about a local framework. So to scale up, we need to make sure that we local governments, we can have that framework, we can have that confidence in the framework over a long period of time. Thank you, and you're willing to work with governments on this? For sure. <laughs> Thank you. Um, James, did you want to add a bit from the World Bank perspective? Well, I was, I was just going to mention on the risk piece, it's also about who takes what risk. And uh, 
I was just going to refer to the auction that uh, we've been involved in in Malawi, where we've managed to secure uh, six cents per kilowatt hour for solar power. And uh, you know, as anybody knows, Malawi is a is a very uh, risky country. So to run an auction that uh, gets to that price is uh, very uh, very promising. Uh, but it's and of course a lot of it's about the financial structure, and the, there's a lot of guarantees going into this. Uh, it's, I mean, it's almost fully guaranteed. So. But it shows that it can be done and now it can't be done unless we get a scaling up of the multilateral development banks beyond all our imaginations it can't be done everywhere but i think it uh, demonstrates uh, how you can allocate risk and how you can price risk and what results that you can you can get in a country that's desperately need in need of renewable and distributed power which uh, malawi is great oh sorry if sorry. i if i if i may so i totally agree and as a matter of fact what we're going to do uh, to go along is we have decided to invest alongside the IFC for 450 million uh, euros uh, just to make sure that indeed you know we are investing alongside big you know the players who are who have the clout to make sure and then for us it's also really important you know we just don't want to have adventures in Africa we want to make sure that basically we can invest in a responsible manner also there thank you Thank you. So we're going to have a bit of time now for audience um, question and answer. So you've heard AXA willing to work with governments to think about how these deals, these investments can be made more investable to scale up um, millions. And um, you heard from City doubling sustainable finance and those really ambitious goals that um, they've been able to deliver on. Um, and then you've also heard um, about the IFC's new reporting on the investment opportunities that there are in the NDCs, all the action that's happening around carbon pricing as well that's supportive. And then um, also from um, Deutsche Bank on the first um, proposal that's been approved from a commercial bank in the Green Climate Fund. Um, so I just want to open it up now to um, the audience. And we have, um, we have some microphones here. Any questions? Thank you. I think if I take um, three initially, one there, one there and one there, and I'm just going to group them. Thank you. I'll come back to that one. Thanks. I think it's just one at the back, Paul, as well. Could you just um, make sure that you really are, if you don't mind me saying so, asking a question as well? <laughs> <laughs> it is a question. A uh, question for City and Deutsche. Um, we are looking as an investor very much also at the green bond market. Could you elaborate a bit on what you see in the trends on the green bond market? Okay. And, um, can I just take the other one? Yes, we need to actually have a standard framework that you use for actually finding these companies, for actually finding the new green companies and evaluating them. Is there a standard marketplace or a, or a place that you guys are going now where they can be objectively evaluated? And starting at the ones that are secure already and profitable, it would be basically the private equity already, and taking it from there, because we Thank need to match them. You. Thank you. And then was there one at the back as well? Just take that. Uh, just a brief one for the gentleman at City, if he could uh, expand very briefly on the guaranteed offtake, or maybe just point us in the direction of more information on that one. Okay. So, um, Mike, maybe if I start with you, um, could you tell us a bit about green bonds trends, and then also just cover off the guaranteed offtakes? Yes, good question, and a timely question, and I do track that personally in my work at the green bond market. Uh, it's only about 10% of my time, but that's a significant piece of my time. So, um, and I was on the team that originated the whole thing. And by the way, what we wrote up in the green bond principles, literally, literally, was we wrote up from notes from selling bonds, speaking to investors, we wrote up what we thought were the best practices of the IFC. Literally, that's what it is. It's the best practices that these banks were already implementing. And, and we adopted that for the corporate and municipal market. And thank you, Vikram, for your good work on that. All right, so the green bond market now is going through a bit of a, a resolution of a revolutionary moment in time. No one realized at the time that what we had done was to create the first use of funds guideline in the 200-year history of the bond market. This is very revolutionary to be declaring the use of funds. After all, that's what the stock market is about. If you want to be dealing with use of funds, then buy the shares, get on the board, oversee management. The bond market is a credit market. It's a risk market. It's not a use of funds market. Now it is. And it's broadening now from green to social bonds, sustainability bonds, 
this is opening up a whole new wing. What that means is we have a couple years of an ecosystem of consultants and auditors and standard boards and Moody's and rating agencies and so forth. And, and, and I even registered the domain name with something in mind, EckhartRatings.com, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, just to say what's happening out there. It's a whole new ecosystem, uh, an asset class in formation. And so we had a rapid growth of early adopters. Then we've had a slowdown as all this resolution happens and so many issuers back up to wait for the dust to settle. Uh, we still have top line growth only because of China came in this year and is literally a third of the market, but the old market has gone flat this year. And I suspect we have two years of this resolution happening and we predicted it. We predicted this was going to happen. We wrote the green bond principles as a, almost a temporary guideline while the debate on what is green was going on. And we were, we who wanted to write bonds for reputational risk were concerned. There was no guideline to protect anybody. Uh, from greenwashing and so on. So we wrote a transparency and a disclosure guideline. You must do that to call it a green bond. So that was all to protect all the players. While the debate goes on about what is green. My last comment on that was from a conversation with the president of one of the rating agencies in a meeting on this subject who in front of his staff said, I don't think I want us working on this until the definition of the word green becomes more clear. And I said, well, sir, just as an analogy, would you please give me your definition of the word creditworthy? <laughs> I said, you exist because we cannot define that word. And you developed, you developed, or your firm developed ratings, which is a language like English, French, German ratings. And I say AAA, you know what I mean? Double A minus, you know what I mean? It's a language. What we need is not a definition of what's green. What we need is a language of green. Then, and, and now they're working on that. It's a good question. On the uh, offtake guarantees, Again, the U.S., Europe, and China have implicitly, without thinking about it, instituted offtake off -take guarantees with the IPP industries and how they're run with government-approved contracts and so on. That is. Can you just quickly explain what they are? What? Very quickly, offtake guarantee, simple language. Oh, what is an offtake guarantee? Oh, sorry. Very quickly. Shop talk. <laughs> uh, an independent project that's financed with, with project money is that money is betting that the buyer of the electricity or the biofuels or whatever, the buyer of the product is going to pay for all those years and pay on time because you have to make your debt payments on time. So we need him to make pay, pay on time. And so that is called the offtake through a power sales agreement or power purchase agreement. It's just the offtake. And, and that entity is off called the utility or the offtake entity or the counterparty, but the general activity there is called the offtake. So what we want is that 20 year stream of revenue to be guaranteed by some entity. And I really applaud the World Bank and I've heard in the last three months and you just described one, had done three or four of these offtake guarantees. So it's beginning, it's catching on, we're getting traction there. And without that offtake guarantee, a commercial bank cannot lend that money, period, zero. Cannot do that. That, that would be, you know, debt is not taking an equity risk. Debt is renting money. It has to be repaid. It's like rent. Uh, otherwise, it has to be equity money, and projects can't afford equity money. They, okay, so we have offtake guarantee. So some third party guarantees, like like the utility of Rajasthan signs a PPA. The Indian government guarantees that PPA. What I'm saying is the World Bank or the uh, Green Climate Fund should have the ability to backstop that guarantee. And a guarantee is different than insurance. Last point, insurance, something goes wrong. Somebody files, there's an investigation, sometime later they write a check. No, no, no. This is guaranteeing revenue to repay debt today. A guarantee pays in 24 hours, then makes the phone call, okay? It's immediate payment so that the project can make that debt payment. That's the difference. Very important, not insurance, guarantee. Thank you, thanks very much, Mike. And I just wanted to come to, and we've covered it a little bit, a bit on um, do we need and is there a standard evaluation framework for these kind of investment opportunities? And maybe if I ask um, you, Eric, as CIO. Sorry, could you repeat the question? Sure. Um, so I think the question was, do we need a standard um, framework to evaluate um, these kind of investment opportunities? Still on the green? Uh, on the green. Still on the green. <laughs> yes, was, I think no. that was the question, right? On the on the green, on the green bond, on the green bond. Yeah, could you could you just restate your question? Sorry, thank you. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. I, I just I'll just make a, just a, a quick comment. I know there there are guidelines, but it is always a subject of debate of what is a green project or not. And I have to say that you know we're looking at bond, which are supposedly green bond issues, and then internally we have our responsible investment team. They're going through the prospectus. They have their own pros you know process to evaluate whether or not they would consider internally whether or not it is really a green bond issue. And I have to say that basically we pass on about one out of 10 with an internal stamp of green bonds. So you know, only one out of 10 that we look at, which were supposedly be green, will only enter into our box, which is called green investment. And that's green bonds. We come with prospectus and specific projects. On the infrastructure, it's even trickier because 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 then you know which projects are falling under the green bond. So we have about so, so what we say is wind farm and so, solar are mostly green, and we just limit it to very tightly limited. So it's even less are green than what we finance through the infrastructure. So, but definitely the definition of green without going into green bashing, and I think we need to protect ourselves from that, uh, is, 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 still, is still, it's still a topic today, at least for us internally. Great, thanks. Um, uh, can I just ask, is um, Rachel Kite here? No, not yet, okay. Okay, great, good. So I think maybe we could take one or two more um, questions, and maybe one down there. I'll just take that first, and then I'll come back to you. Okay. Uh, we heard on the previous panel, the need for a uh, guidance for disclosure of risks. We heard now a lot on, on the risks, but still ESG are not really well understood between mainstream investors. And if I'm to link to what Mike said on the language, I'm wondering if we are to turn risks, especially ESG, into a language for investors, we need to value them. We need to say, what is the value at risk ultimately, you know, for a company to move away let's say from fossil fuel or whatever investment so my question is what is happening into the valuation of risk at the moment especially esg or climate risk thanks so maybe i might ask uh, michael that that's okay yeah yeah i mean i think one of the things that uh, we have internally is sort of a it's like a, i guess a fintech software that tries to blend all the different types of data that we can look at to rank um companies corporates and sovereigns uh, which we call the e the esg engine um, and I think what we do is blend seven external vendors, TrueCost, Ercom, MSCI, Sustainability, all the major ones, and about 15 NGOs, uh, blending all of that data with about uh, 1,700 sort of data covering about 10,000 entities that tries to, pr to rank and to bring together all the various different metrics that you say um, and try and sort of and identifying the sort of the ESG leaders and laggards. And that's sort of one of the ways that we're doing that um, so we can provide, so I should qualify, I work in the asset management bit, it's a bit confusing, we were accredited by Deutsche Bank, I said in asset management, so we provide those sorts of um, uh, risk solutions um, and cleaning and uh, tilting portfolios so that they do take into account those sorts of companies that, um, uh, and I think the whole issue with disclosure and why the task force is so important is that so, so far we're so confined to looking at say carbon emission and fossil fuel reserves we're not looking at green revenue streams or but there are certain providers that do look at that so i think it's really trying to bring all this data together uh, and i think that's sort of one of the things that we're quite proud about of what we've got is that we've got these fantastic engines um, with all the brilliant data that's out there and combining it to to deliver sort of a, to embed those sorts of risks that you're talking about but i'd absolutely agree with you in terms of the language i mean i'm I was, I've been at Deutsche Bank 25 years, and before this space, I was in commodities research. When I was in 2003, commodities were a very strange asset class to people. And what was interesting about that asset class is it's, we brought in many, many new investors into it. And we had the whole risk premium, the carry, the, the momentum, the volatility, all these different risk premium strategies. And in a way, ESG is, is a, like a risk factor. And I think this is what's going to happen. There are going to be people like me who are a bit of an imposter in this space. Um, I've been having FX and commodity background. But I think this is what's interesting that people, there are more and more people like me coming in using the language of traditional investors to make it not so confusing and overwhelming. Because I have to confess, 
I still find it quite overwhelming and confusing. But I think that's my job is to try and try and make it much simpler for people. Thank you, Michael. And we just got one question over there, gentleman uh, with the glasses. Yes, my question is for City and Deutsche. Um, much of the activity that we've seen in the green bond market in the last couple of years has been um, issues that are guaranteed by the balance sheet of the issuer. Could you say a little bit about what you see as the future of this debt market? Do you see, for example, an expansion into asset-backed securities or other forms that are not necessarily backed specifically by the balance sheet of the issuer? Great. Mike, would you be able to take that first? Sure. Uh, Non-recourse uh, financing is is almost borne by the renewable energy or the IPP industry first in natural gas fired projects and then and then uh, more recently renewables. It's not a mainstream. Non-recourse project financing is not mainstream. It just coincidentally, uh, the public sector, the World Bank, the other MDBs do project financing with the same word, but completely different. So we have two very different financings happening in the market using the same word project financing. Uh, in that project financing, it's directed at the debt capital markets, even though there's always equity in it, if it's project financed. We, City, are a corporate bank. We work with a strange entity called clients <laughs> that don't exist in the, in the World Bank world. They just do projects, uh, contractors, and so on. So we, we are very comfortable with balance sheet financing. That's our main business, all right? And uh, and even governments, we look at balance sheets of governments and so forth. Credit worthiness of the borrower. That's, that's a phrase you certainly know. And, and, and how credit worthy is a project that hasn't been built yet, it has no history, and doesn't have a balance sheet nor, or, or, or net worth? <laughs> that's a very odd thing to be financing. And so uh, that's grown up as a specialty out of the IPP industry, is broadening now in the broader project finance. But again, keep in mind, the melding of the IPP world private and the MDB world, both calling projects, project financing, very different. Uh, of the $140 billion bond market, uh, about 12 uh, trillion, about $12 trillion are placed in new placements of bonds per year. Of that, project bonds is less than a half, half a trillion, okay? So it's 5%. Good Thank question. you. Thank you very much. So I'm afraid we've run out of time for questions and answers. Um, we do now have a session with Rachel Kite. Um, so I'd like to thank our panelists. Thank you very much for giving us the inspiration and practical opportunities. So I'm really delighted now to introduce our keynote speaker, Rachel Kite. Um, Rachel's going to close our session today, which has been looking at risk and opportunity and investor actions. And she's very well known to many in the room. So Rachel, we really appreciate you making time for this and running over from something else you've been doing. Um, so um, for those of you um, who don't know, Rachel currently serves as the CEO of the Sustainable Energy for All initiative. And she's also a special representative of the UN Secretary General. Um, and prior to this, she was the World Bank Group's Special Envoy for Climate Change. And in her current role, she's tasked with mobilizing action that's going to give us all affordable, reliable, and clean um, energy all over the world. Um, Rachel's going to talk a little bit about the initiative and how specifically this relates to what the investors um, you've heard from just now are doing. Thank you very much, Rachel. I'm not going to talk about any of that. <laughs> so in the social justice movement, at times like this, we start with fired up. OK, so this is a banking and investment <laughs> group. So I say fired up, you say fired up. And then I say ready to go, and you say? OK, are you ready to go? Thank you. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. So the first thing I want to say is thank you. If you're in this room, I'm making an assumption that you're at the leading edge, that you're waking up in the morning thinking about things in an integrated way, that you have introduced products and services that are 
either making money or are beginning to reveal the extent of the opportunity in the transition to a decarbonized future, that some of you are about to make huge amounts of money for your asset owners, for your investors, for your colleagues, by really showing what this transition is all about. I want to thank you because I imagine that most of you have to have difficult conversations in rooms full of colleagues who have not yet been persuaded. The question uh, that I'll leave you with at the end of this chat is, how do we expand this room? How do we preach beyond the converted? And how do we take this to speed and scale, the one thing that's sort of eluding us at this moment? So there are points of light all the way through the financial sector. You know, there are, there are individuals, there are funds, there are banks, there are new products, there are new services, there is new analysis every day of the week. We can see this building, but we don't have time. The one thing we don't have is time. And so how do we go from here to a much bigger conversation? Carbon is a binding constraint, a binding constraint on the role that the financial sector can play in harnessing uh, the economy into where the economy needs to go. The price of carbon does not reveal today that it is such a binding constraint. The future has begun to change, but not change far enough. So I want to congratulate you on beginning to decarbonize your portfolios, those of you in the room to whom that applies. I want to congratulate you on the innovation, the low carbon indices, the new funds, the new innovations, the new products, the bonds. I want to congratulate you on having the common sense of reading the data, understanding the science, and therefore investing in clean energy. I want to invest some of you for even having the guts to invest in clean energy solutions in emerging markets, because that is the real prize. But you know, and I know, that we're not quite there yet. Notwithstanding what happened in the United States this week, I believe that the combination of investor pressure and disclosure will mean irresistible pressure on firms, both in the carbon intensive energy companies and others, to reveal their exact analysis of risk and opportunity. And that that wider disclosure and the sunshine of transparency will be important in helping the colleagues that you have who haven't yet quite understood where the future is headed to more fully understand the risk, price that risk correctly, and therefore start to see the financial sector driving change the way it should be. In Sustainable Energy for All, we're trying to find our way through and help the world find its way through a conundrum, which is that we have an energy system that does not meet everybody's needs, never has. 1.1 billion people without access to energy, a lot of people with access to filthy energy that's polluting them, decreasing their competitiveness, making their cities unlivable, not giving them options for cooking. So our energy system has never met everybody's needs and we need it to meet everybody's needs. And we need that energy system to be decarbonized and we need it to be clean and affordable and reliable and resilient given the weather impacts that are already being wreaked upon infrastructure assets. So we have to unburden ourselves from the inertia of a energy system which was imagined 150 years ago and which has been fossil fuel based and centralized in its rollout to an energy system that will be distributed, that will meet everybody's needs, that can do so cleanly and affordably, reliably and resiliently. And we're going to have to have new institutions, new organizations, new ways of thinking about the role of government in managing that. We're going to have to do that at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level, at the international level. And it's all affordable. It's all possible to be done. Of all of the sustainable development goals agreed last year, this is the one that can be done. I don't know what the rule of law and peace looks like globally. I don't quite know exactly how you achieve that by 2030. But there is a pathway to sustainable energy for all by 2030. The difficulty is, ladies and gentlemen, that there is a fast, faster, clean, uh, cheaper, 
an easier way to do it, and there is a more expensive, more difficult, more painful way to do it. And what's in, what's in front of us is a choice between those two pathways. It's not linear. There will be moments where we make the more expensive choice just because it's easier politically. Or there'll be a moment where we take a longer pathway because we think we can bring everybody with us that way. But those are the choices. It's not a choice that is in the distant future because we don't have the technology. It's not a choice in the distant future because we don't have the, the finance. The choice is what will it take for the public and private sector informed by the financial sector sense of what is and isn't possible how do we make people or help people make different decisions on monday morning than they're making today how do we show all the stories of what's beginning to happen and translate that into the confidence that you can make a different decision and it will be rewarded in the market it will be rewarded with return it will be rewarded with products and services and real difference in people's lives we are standing on the edge of an era of super efficiency. Imagine the money to be made, the investment to be generated by investing in the picks and shovels of the super efficient appliances, buildings, transportation modes of all of those who are in the middle class, lower middle class and the low income communities of this world who don't have that today the super efficient motor, the super efficient water pump, the super efficient television, the fan, the air conditioner, the lamp, the cell phone, and all of the components of that world. That is the size of the opportunity. The productive demand of the communities that don't have electricity today that can have it and can have it cleanly. The productive demand of the 2.9 billion women-headed households who don't have access to clean cooking. And that's not just in the rural areas of, of, of Western Africa. Those are the communities in the Midwest. Those are the communities in the Northwest of the United Kingdom, the communities that can't afford to turn their power on, no matter how much taxpayers' money we're subsidizing through the grid. There is a real opportunity here, and it's coming because last year we agreed that is the point on the horizon we're all headed to. And that's where we're going. And we're going there by mid-century. So as financiers, as investors, whose job it is to see round the corners, work back from 2030, work out where we need to be as an international community by 2018, by 2020, by 2022, 2025. That is the horizon for your innovation, your creativity, your new products and services. <clears throat> Just in other parts of life, I don't think that when a very um, insular group of people get to make decisions, that they make good decisions for a very diverse world. For those people who've argued that there should be more diverse boards and more diverse management teams in the financial sector, the same is true for the energy sector. Only 6% of the people who sit on the boards of listed energy companies are women. I just don't know how that kind of insular conversation can be broadened up to really be responsive to the risks and opportunities that this new world offers us. And so if this was a debate of, for the last 20 years that didn't go very far in the financial sector, we don't have time. We need to be asking different, different, different questions of the data and the evidence with different people in the room to discuss those questions. And guess what will happen? We will come up with different solutions. So I want to leave you with three challenges or three thoughts, three things to be mused over while we're here in Marrakesh and when we go home. What do you need from people like me, from organizations like Sustainable Energy for All, to bring more of your colleagues and more of your competitors into this room? It's not individual brands that are at risk if we don't manage the energy transition which will drive the economic transformation at the heart of Paris. It's the entire sub-sectors within the financial sector. I remember when Project Finance was at risk in the early 2000s, and 10 banks came together because they understood it wasn't just City that was at risk, or ABN AMRO, or West LB, or Barclays. It was the actual business of Project Finance that was at risk, unless it could win back 
the trust uh, of investors and the trust of communities and the trust of companies. I would argue that we're almost at that point, if not already at that point, in large parts of what we're trying to do in financing the economy to cope with decarbonization and with the resilience needed as we adapt. So what do you need to broaden this conversation? Secondly, what do you need to raise your voices more firmly and more coherently and more cogently than has been the case to date? I know that you've talked about this today. For an industry that can be terribly specific about what you do and do not want in regulation on all kinds of aspects of your business, you are not being very specific about what you need to put long-term money at risk to build this world that we all know is coming. Yes, you've talked about carbon pricing. Yes, you've talked about the difficulty when there isn't a level playing field. Yes, you've talked about the mixed signals that you get from government. Get an awful lot more specific and get in the face of regulators and get in the face of the central banks. We all go down in this boat if we don't find a way to make it sail more smoothly. I also know that in this sector, almost more than any other business sector, you much prefer the ability to move voluntarily than you do when things are imposed on you mandatorily. I would argue that mandatory disclosure is coming, it's just around the corner, and I don't think Tuesday changed that. And so let's see that voluntary action, let's see that flooding forward, let's talk about how your sector can improve the transparency and improve the sunlight that's shining on companies everywhere so that the mom and pop investor as well as the pension fund and everybody else can make better judgments about risk and opportunity. And then, where is the questioning? When you're on the phone with a potential investee company, when you're on the phone with an asset manager, if you're an asset manager, when you're on the phone with the companies in your portfolio, honestly, hand on heart, are you asking them the question? Are you asking them what their plans are to become more energy productive, more productive in their use of resources? Are you asking them how they see the future? Are you asking them how they understand their physical assets at risk from climate change today? Are you asking them about how they see the risk in the new markets that they're opening into? Are you asking them about how they see the opportunity? Are you asking them what they need to see those opportunities more clearly? Constant surveys of the asset management community of investors, of investees, reveal that a bit like exit polls. You tell the polls to one thing, but you do another. I don't think we can afford to see another IIGCC statement at a COP that says we just need X, Y, Z. If you won't actually follow your hearts and follow your minds and follow the evidence and start asking those kinds of questions on a consistent basis. Don't underestimate your power. And don't underestimate the collective power if you all start asking those questions at the same time. So, I want to go back to where I started. Thank you. Thank you for being pioneers. Thank you for being at the front of the spear. Thank you for being the vanguard. We each need to bring everybody else with us. And we're here to support you to make the smartest investment choices you can make. And those are in that decarbonized world and a decarbonized world that serves everybody's needs. Thank you very much. Great. I'd um, just like to wrap up and close this session by um, saying thank you, Rachel, for recognizing our efforts um, and for giving us those challenges, including the time horizons. Um, not only are you an eloquent speaker, but you also have amazing powers to know what we were saying, even though you weren't in the room. <laughs> Either that or we are very predictable. Um, so thank you for all of those um, challenges. Um, I also wanted to thank all of our speakers who've traveled from afar today, um, investors um, with um, markets um, to think about and clients who've had many questions this week about the elections and the implications. Um, and then um, personifying collaboration, um, just to say thank you to the seven investor groups from different regions that organized the event today. Um, it has been a true collaboration. Um, firstly, thank you to Sirius from the US, um, to UNEP FI, the Institutional Investor Group on Climate Change um, for Europe, 
the Institutional Investor Group on Climate Change from Australia, AIGCC, um, Carbon Tracker, um, and um, particular thanks to Chris Fox, um, who has been our organizer here today. Thank you. Um, <laughs> And um, finally, um, thank you to um, the UNFCCC and the Moroccan government for hosting today. And if you're wondering, well, what happens next? Um, all you need to do is look at um, investorsonclimatechange.org. That is our collaborative investor platform where um, we list our actions that we are taking. Keep an eye on those, see what we're doing. And um, thank you very much.